what is, and I'm being serious here because for our generation, and I still carry a hard copy of the newspaper with me every day, that is not what the younger generation does. What is the future of the newspaper? You know, and, and will it be called the newspaper? Right, right. Yeah, if we had a crystal ball, of course, um, you know, I think we'd be uh, much higher paid than we are. But there's going to be a print edition for many, many years to come. Um, there's a huge infrastructure for print still. People who like the print edition love, love the print edition. You know, they hang on every word. And the internet has made the print edition more valuable to a lot of people because a newspaper, a print newspaper, is edited for you. People who do nothing but cover the news all day long choose what's important, put it out front. And they tell you this is the stuff to listen to, and they just don't put the garbage in, right? And right. so people who've grown up with that really value that. That's, I think, one of the things that's been lost the most in what I call the choose-your-own-adventure news business that is the Internet. I think most people, whether they love the media or hate the media, and most people, I think, whether it's radio, TV, or print, they hate the media. But there, there's no denying that there is a function for the media within any good, solid democracy. However, the small-town newspapers... I don't know how they survived. The Ottawa Heralds, the Lawrence Journal Worlds, um, dare I say even maybe the Topeka Capital Journals of the world. How do they survive in an age where, let's be honest, the older generation, our generation and older are the ones that cling to the hard copy. Right. Generations like my daughters and her kids and Dave, your daughters right, who are, right. who are right. in their 20s, they don't get, they don't go up to the newspaper stand on the corner and put in 50 cents anymore. Yeah. The small town papers are going to die, will they not? I think that there's always going to be a value in local news. One of the things that regional newspapers, big regional papers like the Star, has really uh, have really done in the past 15 years is focused much more on local news. Yes, uh, because it used to be, you know, 25 years ago, you go go to the microfilm and take a look at virtually every newspaper in the country was carrying the same exact uh, wire content. Right? Yeah. And that was a huge chunk of what those pa those bigger papers used to be. But nobody else out there is really covering Kansas City City Hall. And then when you get to the Ottawas of the world, that's yeah, that is the twenty thousand dollar question: how they're going to fill that void in the future. Because in those smaller communities, let's be honest, it is very important to have that coverage. But the bigger cities don't have the staffs to do it. I'm Not talking anymore. about I'm talking about television here too. So yeah. when was the last time uh, Channel Nine or you guys from the star sent a reporter to a let's say Lenexa city council meeting i mean we we don't have the staffs to cover every government you know, the, function the anymore the star used to have bureaus you used to have a In kck bureau kck johnson county independence mm -hmm. north of the river with multiple reporters who spent yeah. time keeping an eye on this stuff uh, we just don't have the ability to do that anymore. And if you talk to people in places like Kansas City, Kansas, they deeply regret not having uh, a newspaper presence or some journalistic presence. You know, Scott, you said everybody hates media. Yeah, they hate media until they want information. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, yeah, we kind of like what you do. And if you go to a town like Kansas City, Kansas, they will tell you, we're rumor central because there's no report. You know, reporters right. aren't around to knock down rumors or innuendo or so they actually regret not having a bigger presence question from the text line what do you guys think about a publicly funded media either that or some kind of a subsidy to big media companies to run their news outlets as non-profit entities a lot of greater minds than I have contemplated that kind of thing. Also, the the idea has been floated for foundations to be set up, you know, yes. by by philanthropists. And you know, the the major caveat to that would be there would have to be a hundred percent accountable and transparent, hands off attitude towards whatever that entity is that's funding the journalism. Right, and I I just don't think that's possible. I've been against that for ever. You just don't want to depend on the public for your funds. You. You're, you're, you're looking out for the public, and, and, and to the extent that someone could uh, impugn your integrity sure. because you're getting a tax break or whatever, now we got a tax break for the for the printing plant, okay. And well, not TIF, no TIF. No TIF, but it was a tax <laughs> advantage. Um, you know, we, we, we can't be completely pure. We take well, advertising, so you can't be completely pure. Nobody can be, but to the extent we can try, that's better, always better to me and some sort of publicly funded deal where you get a subsidy from a government to do what well, you do. The Star for years, the editorial page, certainly was, was widely caricatured as the Kansas City Red Star. There has been a sea change, Derek, I think you would agree, with the way the editorial page conducts itself. Uh, and quite frankly, I applaud it. 
when did this start? Why did it start? And I think it's fair to say that you can't necessarily assume that the editorial page is liberal anymore. Well, you know, uh, we have a new vice president for the editorial page, Colleen McCain-Nelson, who's been on since about the beginning of the year, and we have an all-new board. Uh, nobody uh, um, who's serving on the board right now uh, was in place before she came on. And uh, I don't want to speak for Colleen, but I think that all of our intention is to try to be open and try to be honest and try to approach issues without being doctrinaire. And, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of, of variety among us on the board about what our points of view are. There have been times when we have our group discussions and uh, we're not all on the same page, very definitely. But, you know, one of our very first big editorials was after um, uh, the election was to say, give Donald Trump a chance. And that's something that we, you know, really felt like uh, that any American ought to do. And so that's why we wrote that and, editorial. And by the way, still think that way. I mean, for mm -hmm. all the Agreed. problems that he's had, to go immediately to let's get rid of the guy it just didn't make any sense to us whatsoever. That isn't really a partisan decision. That's much more of a just a good government decision. And, and I think that's really, from my point of view, really what we're about, which is good quality government, good representation, a good, honest, fair, open community. That's not really Republican or Democrat to me. It's much more... You know, we, we wrote maybe seven or eight times on the airport controversy. And what we kept saying over and over was, do what you want to do, but make it open. Make it transparent. Let people know what you're doing. That's not partisan to me. And that's what good editorial pages should do, I think, is hold people accountable of both sides. That's what we're trying to well, do. And I said